Alright guys, welcome to part 2 of the Ultimate DIY Pool Heater. In part 1 I went over the assembly, the construction, and how to set all this up and operate it. And here in part 2 I'll mostly be covering the performance of the heat exchanger and what you can expect from this in heating your pool. For my experiment I got the fire going nice and hot and waited until the water reached a hot steady flow. I then grabbed the tube out of the pool and threw it into a 5 gallon bucket and timed how long it took to fill the bucket. I sped up most of the video here, but you will see that it eventually fills at 124 seconds. I then immediately measured the temperature of the water inside the bucket, which in this case was 126.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Knowing that it took 124 seconds to fill 5 gallons at 126.2 degrees Fahrenheit, I can then do some simple math to convert this into a flow rate of gallons per minute, or GPM for short. In this case, filling up 5 gallons in 124 seconds converts to a flow rate of 2.42 GPM. With this data, we can now build a plot of flow rate versus temperature. We know that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, so I plotted that line. For on average, my input water into the heat exchanger was roughly 75, so I plotted that line. From there, we can begin to plot the data from these experiments, and in this first example, we have a flow rate of 2.42 GPM, and the temperature of the water is at 126.2 degrees Fahrenheit. I essentially re-ran this same experiment over a dozen times while varying the flow rate to get a range of data. The fastest flow I could achieve with this integrated into my existing pool setup using my existing pool pump was just over 3 GPM. The sweet spots seemed to be at around 1.5 GPM with both of the valves fully open and 2.5 GPM with the PVC ball valve halfway closed. I noticed that if I closed the PVC ball valve all the way, you could tell that the tone of the pump changed and it sounded like it was working a lot harder. So I would not recommend doing this because you are essentially trying to force all of that water through a 5 8 inch garden hose, which is putting a lot of stress on the pump. So always leave the PVC ball valve partially open to relieve some of that pressure. Once I finished all my experiments and converted all the flow rates as I discussed, I ended up with a plot that looks something like this. For those sweet spots that I talked about, I took those clusters of data points and averaged them into a single data point which then made my plot look like this. I then added a trend line which ends up being a decreasing exponential curve which is sort of what I was expecting. Using the trend line formula, I then calculated and tabulated the expected temperature at different flow rates in increments of half of a gallon per minute. Keep in mind that this data is valid with an input water temperature of 75 degrees. The big question now is, what flow rate should you use to heat your pool? Is it better to add hot water at a low flow rate or to add warm water at a high flow rate? To answer this question, I did some more math. Let's take a look at a hypothetical example. In this example, I start with a full pool at 73 degrees. If the pool is a 24 foot by 4 foot round pool, then it would contain roughly 12,000 gallons when filled all the way. Let's say you want to run your bonfire for 6 hours on a Saturday afternoon and add water at a flow rate of 2.5 GPM. We know from the data I collected that at a flow rate of 2.5 GPM, the average water temperature would be 116 degrees coming from the pool heater. At that flow rate, you can expect to convert 900 gallons of the pool water to 116 degrees over the course of the six hours. Those 900 gallons of 116 degree water will mix with the other 11,100 gallons of pool water that is at 73 degrees. From physics class, we learned that the standard formula for calculating the final temperature of a water mixture is the mass of the water at one temperature plus the mass of the water at the second temperature divided by the total mass. We know that mass and volume are related through density, so if I assume a constant water density, I can use the volume of the water in my formula 
After plugging in the numbers, we see that the final temperature would end up being 76.23 degrees. This means that over the course of 6 hours, we could expect to heat a 12,000 gallon pool by 3.23 degrees if we neglect any input from the sun and any losses through the floor or walls of the pool. Take that 3.23 degrees and divide that by 6 and you get the average temperature increase per hour of 0.54 degrees. I repeated these mixture calculations for every flow rate and you end up with a curve that looks like this. You can see that the optimal flow rate ends up being 2 GPM. Any lower or any higher will yield lesser results. I then calculated the expected temperature increase per hour for different round pool sizes at the different flow rates. You can see that for all of them, using 2 GPM is still the most optimal flow rate for this heat exchanger. And you can also see that as your pool size decreases, you will heat it up much better, which makes perfect sense because there's less water. On the day that I filmed this video, I started around 2 p.m. with a pool temperature of roughly 73 degrees, just like in the hypothetical example, and I ran my heater for 6 hours until 8 p.m. I calculated the final temperature in my pool that day to be just over 80 degrees, so I was able to heat it around 7 degrees in a 6 hour time frame. From the math I just discussed, this ends up being a bit higher than we would expect, and that can be attributed to the fact that it was a sunny 80 degree day. Therefore, I would recommend using this pool heater on a hot day so that you can add maximum temperature to your pool. The extra heat coming in from the sun will result in a higher input water to the heat exchanger, which will make the entire system more efficient overall. So the final thing I wanted to mention in this video is the cost breakdown. I split this up into the different sub-assemblies, and you can see that for the heat exchanger, it costs a little over $200 and a majority of that cost comes from the coil itself which is $160 but don't cheap out and get a shorter coil or else it won't heat the water as much. It costs around $60 for all the fittings and valves that you'll need for the flow diverter and all the hardware and tubes that you'll need for your hose connections are a little over $37 and don't forget that in order to hook up the flow diverter you'll need to purchase an additional pool hose. Overall, you can expect this to come out to a little over $300, and after tax, it's around $330. So you can expect this to take about four to five hours to put everything together, and after you have it set up the first time, it'll take less time after that because you never have to disconnect the flow diverter. The 20 minutes of setup time will only consist of putting the burn barrel out in the yard, making the hose connections, and starting yourself a bonfire. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the results that I get from mine. If I run the pool heater for half a day, I could easily get 5 to 7 degrees of temperature increase. And if I run it for a full day, I can get almost up to 10 degrees. And this is for a 12,000 gallon pool. And another thing to mention is that this doesn't just work when it's hooked up into your pool circuit. You can actually just hook the garden hose straight to the bottom leg of the coil and actually fill the pool with hot water. If you had a small kid sized pool or even a hot tub, you could fill the entire thing in a single day with hot water. Overall, in terms of DIY pool heaters, I have not found another design that could heat a pool 10 degrees in a single day. So if you're going to spend the money and build a pool heater, I would recommend that you build something similar to what I've built. Even if you don't want to build the heat exchanger the same exact way, I would still recommend that you build the exact same flow diverter and route that to a different pool heater depending on how you would like to build one. Alright guys, thanks for watching part 2 of the Ultimate DIY Pool Heater. I hope this video series was informative and gave you enough information and data to figure out whether or not you want to do this yourself. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned for the next project.